some uh, the bridge on the southeast corner of the neighborhood there. Um, essentially looking at that and then what may, neighbors might think would make sense in a future uh, uh, traffic uh, pattern there. We know that that is, uh, you know, kind of an overbuilt uh, bridge in the highway style there. So this is the proposed boundary and uh, then if, if we hop to the next slide, I'll walk you through kind of our uh, high level timeline. Um, so this spring, we'll, uh, the team will be doing the background investigation, uh, working to select a consultant that will help develop the plan, and then developing the engagement process. Really, uh, where we're at right now is the planning team has just taken a look at putting that map together and looking at the, the piece of what, what boundaries make sense. So we'll be working to develop the engagement process, and then August to September, is when that engagement process will play out with the neighborhood and the neighbors. Um, and then that leaves October to December for the planning team to take that back, work with the consultant, develop the draft plan, and then hopefully by uh, January, February 2023, um, the planning commission and then common council uh, can, can weigh in and, and choose to uh, adopt the plan. So that's, uh, that's the piece there. Um, as far as 2023, you know, we're tentatively uh, looking at LaSalle Park and River Park being on the uh, kind of, you know, uh, what's the baseball phrase on on deck for uh, the next uh, neighborhood plan. But uh, those are tentative and that's 2023, but just want to throw that out there. LaSalle Park and River Park are kind of uh, on our radar there. So. We're really excited to uh, engage with neighbors in Monroe Park, and uh, you know, I think if there are any questions, Margie, I, you know, we look forward to working with you, and, and we'll certainly, um, hopefully, the planners have been in touch, but they'll continue to be in touch, and we'll, um, uh, you know, look forward to the engagement process through through this plan. Well, uh, on behalf of our neighborhood, thank you so much. Uh, this was really exciting, and something, of course, we've been hoping for. And, and we'll be happy to work with you all and excited to see what will come of it. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, being in good hands with Caleb and the team, and obviously it's amazing just to see even with this group what we've been able to accomplish working together in less than a year. Let's Linda, Gary, thank you for the... You have the a question. I have a quick question. Yeah. Yeah. So when I went to your neighborhood um, uh, meeting, you guys said that you had your strategic plan, um, what you guys say, um, adopted by the city? No, we, we had applied for that. Okay. Um, and that's what, yeah. So does, does River Park need to do something like that? I don't think we have that. Yeah, so the Monroe Park had the history to work with uh, Habitat. Habitat. Oh, yeah. And um, in building together, uh, a strategic plan. So that's a great exercise. These neighborhood plans have, again, like all things government, they have a kind of statutory format because they define zoning. They help update the zoning. There's some land use. There's some kind of technical pieces that are informed by the plan. That Monroe Park doesn't have them yet, so we wouldn't be able to adopt the strategic plan because there has to be kind of a process around and some technical pieces that need to be fixed up. But that's partly when we requested from everyone to submit their interest in in, in applying for being kind of the neighborhood that we be applying for this year. The fact that they've already been doing a lot of the work, getting organized, having a vision, starting to structuring those things, so it's work. Uh, we had heard interest from River Park and from uh, places where there'd be the next round of, of, uh, of plans. Those are subject to appropriation from council, so we... That was just something that went off in my head, like, should we be working on this? Or is there like a form we need to fill out? Or what is this? No, so, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to and there's plenty of time. But it does help, okay. again, this, this is why we're here together. When you organize, when you help bring people together, when you start convening, it makes it so much easier. It makes for better plans, it makes for a better community. So starting to think about it, obviously we're still 
depending, there's a lot of pieces of the too, well, but we wanted to make sure that you all knew that you were the next in line that we were thinking about. So investment usually that follows the, the neighborhood plans. We look at them as ways of incorporating projects and yeah, like the neighborhood doesn't live in isolation, it's connected to other things. So the neighborhood plans help draw, draw that out. Um, and for 2024, then we'll have to look at what are other neighborhoods, what are some other areas of the city that haven't received oh, yeah. so no, no, we don't need to Okay. I just was just like, does that need to be on our <laughs> I did want to say that is cool that you guys had a strategic plan on its own and yeah. neighborhood property should just ask how they do that. Yeah. We'd be happy to, to share what we have. But um, beyond that, uh, that does wrap up city moves. There's a bunch of information inside of the um, monthly report. Um, the easy program, if you know any comfort properties, churches, or schools, the folks that can solar systems or efficiency programs that grant is still up running. So please encourage people to apply. I think it's the end of the month. And yep, there's a lot of resources in that. So just one yeah. final piece here is the uh, last uh, page here is the utility assistance program. So you, you may have seen that we uh, clean the slates uh, of people who got behind on utility bills uh, over the course of the pandemic. And so uh, over the past few weeks, those who had been over 60 days past due, uh, residents got their their uh, outstanding balance cleaned up to uh, $2,500. So that should that account for almost everyone that was behind on their utility. That one was automatic, uh, so people didn't have to apply. But this, uh, this one that's advertised uh, here at the final page, you do have to sign up for, and that's for those who qualify by income and need help uh, on an ongoing basis. So this isn't a one-time pandemic thing. This is uh, in the you know the council uh, when they passed the rates, they they included an expansion of that program. So we thank them for that and trying to get people to sign up. So uh, we think we're at about 25% of households who could qualify signed up. So that means. Get the folks to, need us to spread the word. Right, we need to get all <laughs> people to sign up to take advantage of that. And of course, you know, when we look at reinstating uh, shutoffs later in the year and, and how we approach that, uh, folks who are falling behind on their bill will obviously point them to this program too. But it's also good to get those programs. And one other quick piece: um, there's a lot of information in the Another, uh, we're hoping for. Uh, folks to come out. We've got three upcoming open houses to collect feedback on uh, what residents would like to see as far as kind of a, a reimagined home repair program uh, from the city. So the first one is actually tomorrow night um, at Howard Park Event Center at 5.30 to 7. Uh, the second one will be next Tuesday uh, at the Charles Black Center. Uh, also from 5.30 to 7. And then the third will be uh, Thursday of next week at IU South Bend, Wine Camp Hall, room 1135. And we can send this out in an email afterwards. Uh, also from 5.30 to 7. And what these are are just open houses, so it's not uh, that people have to come for the full hour and a half, but they can just stop in. There will be different booths with information about uh, uh, the home repair programs of the past and what our team is kind of thinking about as different options and, and people will be able to weigh in on how they would like to see the program develop and unfold. So would love uh, if, if you would be able to help share that out to your networks and uh, you know we're, we're looking forward to uh, you know reviewing kind of people's thoughts on that program. So for context there's 2.5 million dollars that were earmarked by the council the administration for home repair for next year. So this would be to help design the first part of that those twenty five million. So and 
come tomorrow night, or I'll get the ones next week too. I look forward to seeing you there. We'll follow up with the um, day three, right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for the city news. Um, today our guest is uh, Nick, and um, she's Lukowski. That's Welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be here. Um, to start off. <laughs> to start off, um, could you just share a little bit about yourself, you know, what would you like us to know, and um, one great thing you look forward to regarding your job in the community? <laughs> um, so, Scott Raskowski, I've been on the police department, this is, as a matter of fact, we go to the academy together, so this is our 35th year that we have starting, we just started. Um, so, yeah, we got hired in October of 88 and sworn in March of 89. So, with that, I've been doing, I've been in this, I went to um, Oliver for kindergarten. Some of you may or may not remember that. Um, and then I went to Our Lady and then the Holy Cross and then to uh, Brown Middle School and LaSalle High School. Then I went to service for uh, six years, worked for the street department for two years, plus a whole bunch of other jobs in between. Uh, I was, this is what people won't know about me. I was married for 14 months. My oldest boy is 37 years old. I have two grandkids and three other boys. Uh, my youngest boy being 16 years old. Um, so I had to, when I got out of the service and went through a divorce after 14 months, I had to move in with my mom and dad because I was in quite a bit of debt, uh, $60,000 worth as a matter of fact. Um, but giving my mom my checkbook and all of my paychecks and working two full-time and two part-time jobs, I never had a day off for two years, uh, paid off everything. Um, and, then, and then here we are. Uh, she still doesn't take a day off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, she, she would. Yeah, so I, I became chief, chief October 15th, or no, October 1st of 2015 at 1.32 p.m. Uh, we'll talk about later why I retired yeah. so vividly. And there's just so much stuff, but I wanted to just say a couple things. Uh, first of all, as Mayor alluded to, um, he started doing the public safety quarterly meetings, which is pretty phenomenal. We also do monthly board of safety meetings, um, and we also do on call, if you will, if one of the council members uh, who heads the health and public safety committee or a council member has some issues in their neighborhood. Um, and I say, Lori sits right here, so she's got a problem that she needs to contend with. Even if it's not in her neighborhood, she will be on me, and then we'll make sure that we, we work on that. Um, with all that being said, I would invite you, please, to tune in to any one of those Health and Public Safety uh, Committee uh, for the Council, the quarterly meetings, our Board of Safety meetings. But if you, if you don't, um, we have a transparency hub on our South Bend Police Department website. It's under helpful links. You can click right on there. And if you're really bored someday, you can deep dive into so much, and there's so much information in there. Uh, every day when I go on there, there's always something different that I see where you, where you can really get into the, the, the layers of the proverbial onion if you want to. But anything that you could possibly think of from part one crimes, criminal assault shootings, all of our updates for the last four years, we refresh every four years on those. Um, please do so and, and maybe pass the word on to others. I know that. I don't see Pam Quaid on here, but I can assure you that if she gets on there, everybody knows her uh, as well, uh, Llewellyn, and, and I know sometimes Mr. T will, will get on there uh, too and, and do some snooping around, which is absolutely welcome because the, the more feedback we have, the better we can all get. Um, thank you. Um, Nick, is Nick here? Yep. Yeah. I'm from the uh, Consolidated 911 Center. Uh, I've been with the 911 Center in my ninth year now. So I started with county police before we were consolidated dispatch center and went through the entire merge, which has been a great time for everybody. Um, uh, I'm, I'm here because I know one of our dispatchers attended Mishawaka's uh, neighborhood meetings and there was kind of a conception that the dispatch center was blowing off the calls or taking them seriously. 
So I'm trying to rectify that. We have monthly training committee meetings, um, and that's where a lot of policies get updated. And so we're, I'm definitely here for the feedback from you guys as well. Um, I want to make sure that we have an open line of communication and that you guys aren't feeling that way when you are calling in. Thank you for introducing yourself, and thank you for being here. Um, we, um, our team have come up with some questions to better understand the procedures and really our goal is to find out how can us, the people, help um, in our community? How can we come aside you and help and maybe have a little bit more understanding on um, what goes on? Um, so that's the focus of these questions. Um, the first question is, what is the procedure for the dispatch call for the victim? Um, so when we, we get a call for service, um, someone calls in, our call taker will launch a software a protocol basically so that every caller gets the same level of treatment. So depending on what information you give us, they're going to select um, a generic call type and it's going to launch a series of questions basically for the caller. So if you call in a suspicious person lurking around, it's going to ask, you know, when did this happen? Is it in, in progress? Uh, what do they look like? What exactly are they doing? Do you see any weapons? How did they arrive to the area? Uh, so it's basically just a, a, a you know, list of questions that we go down. Um, that's, that's basic call intake. <laughs> so, um, who reviews the calls for quality control? We have our own internal uh, quality assurance unit. Right now they're understaffed like everybody else's, so they're contracting with a, a national unit to grade some calls as well. But we do have our own internal team that has a, a certain quota per week that they have to pull X amount of calls and review them. Um, we have a lot of people in training too, and every one of their calls gets pulled. So. It's a, it's a mix of both an internal and an external team. Thank you. Um, does anyone, um, anyone with a dispatch follow up with the victim or callers? Uh, no, not generally, no. Thank you. Uh, what are the difference in how calls are handled when the victim versus witnesses, neighbors who call in? Uh, not, not a drastic difference. Um, is, is that for me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's you know if it's a a third party caller, usually they're not they don't want contact if they're just reporting something that they're seeing. So some of the questions are more broad instead of specific. Um, but it's it's the base same basic general questions. Of what exactly are you seeing happening? And um, so. If I was to call, um, say I, I noticed something happened, but I do not want you or anyone to show up on my front door right. for my personal safety, is there any code road words we could say to like alert you that we don't want to be contacted like that day? That <laughs> I mean, honestly, just like point blank tell. Tell the call taker that you don't want contact. Um, the safest way is to just don't provide your own address. You can always tell us that you want to remain anonymous if you don't want to give your name or phone number. Um, but we do need to have a verified location to enter a call for service. So we have to have either an address that verifies or an intersection. So if you want to give the intersection of Sample and, and Franklin, uh, we just have to have a location that verifies in the system. We can't you know, just create a call on Sample Street, for instance. We had neighbors that were concerned about that. Uh, yes. Because a lot of people don't call in because when they have called in, the police showed up on their doorstep, and then a lot of them don't know the house number across the street. So then they're like, okay. and then a lot of us, you know, we're so uh, technology has taken away our brain cells of knowing where north and south is. Yeah. <laughs> and so, at least for me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 
so sometimes we're just like, whoa, we don't we don't know the house number, but we know ours, and we know it's three doors down. Yeah. But when we say our address, but three doors down, it doesn't get transferred to the police officer. That address is what they come to. Yeah. And so more and more people are not calling in because of that fear that I've I've gotten in contact with. That is yeah, neighbors. Definitely. A problem. I mean, and it's because the call taker is removed from the dispatcher. Basically, it's going through two different people before it even makes it to the officer. So you have a, a call taker that maybe enters in a note that says the caller explicitly does not want contact, but the dispatcher is juggling, you know, six other calls, and maybe that note wasn't made very obvious to them, and, and perhaps missed it. Officer could have missed it as well on their way to driving, you know, to a to a hot call. It's usually written in the comments section of our dispatch if the caller wants contact or not. And if it's not a hot call, we pretty much read it all the time and we know not to go where they don't want us to go. But if it's like a hot call and we're within a couple blocks, sometimes we don't have time to read the whole comment section and some of that could be on us. And I think, I'm trying to read between the lines here and my guess is people don't want their names or addresses given over the radio because people have scanner apps now and it freaks them out. It's totally understandable. But like Joe said, the dispatchers usually are pretty good, but they are short staffed. I think we have 62 total to run 24 7, 365. No, you know, you know I mean, and I know they're mandatory uh, uh, 16 hours uh, a lot of times. Not all, not all, right. but a lot of times. <laughs> um, so, with that being said, yeah, uh, there's we can still work off anonymity. Uh, but I will tell you, probably as, as equal. People want to re remain anonymous, but they can still leave their number in the comment section, and, and most of most of our officers will call them, set up a time later on to talk in person, or maybe just get more information over the phone once they've um, made the scene as safe as possible at that time. So that that is something that could be really, because we really want to talk to human beings to find out what really happened. Um, because when we pull up there, it's usually not what we're being told. It's always going to be something different, but that, whoever that other person is, has a whole different perspective and can look, there's your truth, my truth, and then somewhere in between and somebody else really has the truth. That, that's what we typically find out and probably that person calling in who is not a victim and who is not a suspect um, has that, that rightful information. Yeah, if you could pass that, that would be straight from your dispatcher can shoot that right into the comment section would never have to can read it later. So you're saying when someone calls in and don't want to be notified, um, you can give a phone number and then the police would call, contact yep. them afterwards? Yep. yep. Okay. Well, that answered two questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are good. <laughs> Feel free to yeah. jump in and ask questions. Did they say it up front, so it's at the top of the comment, does it go sequentially in the comment section? I mean, it's like, I would say fourth question in is we ask what's your, what's your phone number and, and then what's your name? So right then you can just say, you know, when we ask what your phone number is, I want to remain anonymous or I don't want to give you my phone number um, or, or I, just, I just want the officer to contact me via phone, you know, something along those lines. Okay. And well, since we are, it seems like hiring for dispatch, right? What are the qualifications in the training for becoming a dispatch? Uh, it's it's about a six month training program that they run through right now. So they do uh, like a pre-hire shadow. They come in and see what the job really consists of because no one really knows what you're getting into when you, when you take on that job. Uh, so they, they do a shadow for about a week and then have to take a, uh, a test that kind of throws them a little bit of a simulated dispatch scenario. So kind of multitasking, typing while you're hearing things come at you out of order. Um, as long as they pass that test, pass a drug screen, uh, then they're offered a job. Uh, they go through a medical call taking class that's three days long, a uh, fire call taking class that's two days long, police specific class that's another two days, and then they have like a general overview class that's five days long. They do some geography, uh, schoolwork. So they're in a classroom setting for about three to four weeks before they even come out onto the floor. And then once they come to the floor, they learn call taking first. As long as they pass that, they go on to fire dispatching, which is a mix of 
putting out fire calls for service and call taking at the same time. And uh, we, so basically, we have like six different layers of training going on right now. Once they pass the fire side, then they begin on the, the police dispatching side. And what's the typical hours, like work hours? Uh, officially, we are on eight hour shifts, uh, six day on, three day off rotation. We're on, generally, it's, it's almost a 12 hour shift every day. We're dipping into some day off mandates now because of short staff. Uh, and a lot of that is if everyone was healthy and came to work, we wouldn't have issues, but you have your daily call offs, and, you know, we have a pretty good vacation package. So a lot of people off on benefit time creates a lot of the overtime. So it just kind of self-perpetuates. And this is when they did the, the consolidation. Uh, I don't know how to nicely say it. They uh, significantly underestimated the need of staff, uh, the original director. We're now three directors past that. And just in this year's budget, it seems like we finally got a path forward to get the right. I, I think we're, we're increased the level of, like, when we're fully staffed, we're moving up to what we need. Uh, the, the county uh, passed some pay uh, increases to be more competitive. Uh, so. We're on. We're on the. We're moving in the right direction, but they are. They have been overstretched, and, and they continue to be overstretched until we, until we get there. And we did have a higher increase during COVID, and, and lost a, a bit of staff. Just normal retirement and you know terminations that, that do happen uh, just routinely. So it set us back quite a bit. Just just having that higher increase for almost a, you know nine months to a year, whatever it was, definitely set us back. Thank you. So how many departments are they serve, are you serving? We just dispatch for eight, I believe, police departments and uh, 11 fire departments. Eight police departments and 11 fire? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, full county? Yep. Yeah, full county run out right yep. now. Like Roseland, for example, is the way out New Carlisle Police, New Carlisle Police. Yeah. Yeah. From one end of the county to the other. Uh, thank you. Um, how can the public and the dispatch staff better help each other? Oh. <laughs> what, are your, what, are your, what do your people complain about when we call in? Yeah. Like, like, what do we need to do better on our side when we are calling in? I don't know that I could, I can't really offer any. What people complain about is, is um, you know, mostly like attitude, but we're dealing with people who are in emergencies. So I don't want to say, you know, right. fix your attitude. That's an, that's an unfair expectation. Maybe stay calm. Try to stay calm. Right. Try, try to stay calm. Exactly. Or if even if you can't stay calm, try to stay clear with your words. As long as we can understand where you're at, we're going to be able to get you some help. I mean, that's job number one. That's that's <laughs> that's really all. I don't have any critiques for our callers. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two important ones. Yeah. Gotta understand what you're saying. What would you like? <laughs> what would you like um, to see more from the public? That goes for either or. There's uh, our so one of our biggest problems, especially in the winter time, is people calling in uh, crashes or you know they see a car flipped over on the side of the road. And we'll get 15 calls about the same car that's been down in this ditch for, you know, 12 hours. And I know it sounds it sounds kind of bad to say that I wish more people would would stop and check to see if somebody's, you know, hurt or something like that. Because I understand no one really wants to put themselves in danger, and it's not always safe to pull over on the bypass when cars are going 70 miles an hour in an ice storm. But um, we get a lot of duplicate calls from from people who are just kind of driving by the whole. I don't really want to get involved. We get that call a million times a day, and I mean the reality is, if it weren't for that call, there 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 wouldn't be a call for service. They are the entire involvement. Um, it would be beneficial to get some to solid you know some solid information for our responders if, if people basically could could I don't want to say investigate because I, I don't want anyone putting themselves in harm's way. But uh, you know if it's a it appears to be a safe situation, maybe stop and check and see if somebody's hurt something along those lines. We need people to get more involved because let's face it, the citizens are the eyes and ears of the police department. When crime happens, we're not there, they're there. They know what went on. I don't know of any crime that takes place where somebody doesn't know something 
I mean, you got to have one person to commit a crime, and there's always somebody else. So the information that they have, whether it's a, when we're on scene or a day later or whenever, we need that because somebody that, and it's not us seeing what took place. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, please feel free to speak up. Um, I have several questions, and they're all over the map. But I think they are in regard to I've advocated for, well, let's start out with the fact that safety and health, and then they'll say crime, are always buzzwords. I think we all agree, regardless of where you live. So, question number one. With the possibility of having safety security cameras at intersections, especially Mayflower and West Avenue, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that if the Mayflower is half county and half city, I understand that. And then I heard that, that it's a state law that does not allow security cameras. I'm not sure about that. Good. So <laughs> then, um, I've advocated for that in light of being um, you're having problems hiring officers to do all of the wonderful things that you do, and a security camera especially at the entrance and exit of, of, of South and Indiana would be beneficial. So um, question number one, can we, what do we, can we have one and what do we need to do? So I'm going to, I'm actually going to defer to the mayor right now because I, we, yeah, we, we, we have made presentations to the council. We do have throughout the city, many of our corridors, they're called block cameras or license plate readers. They'll take still images of every vehicle that passes through there. Should that vehicle, primarily we're looking for missing or endangered per, endangered persons, kidnapping, things like that, mm -hmm. um, primarily. But we have also used them. We, we have over 120 some crime resolved but just because of those cameras that we have now. And I'm, I'm, I'm leery to say cameras because you know how people freak out with cameras. Okay. But to the question you asked earlier before I let the mayor maybe, maybe let the, I don't want to say surprise out of the bag, but there is a law that downstate that they have that you, for um, red light cameras, that's probably what you heard referring to. You can't specifically use them for entrapment purposes, meaning uh, speeding through a construction zone and they'll take those pictures of the speed of the car and then the same thing with the red lights like they have in Chicago. Yeah. That's that's what you're referring to. How, however, uh, Mayor, I'll be putting you on the spot here. But I'm not sure how much that we can. No, we we've talked about. I mean, we've talked about the idea, uh, particularly on the residential side, about uh, uh, you know, eyes. Uh, you know, if if residents want to install cameras, that's that's still a work in progress to figure out how to deploy that. But that's very much uh, something we're interested in. Uh, Chief talked about the flock cameras, so. Um, we installed, what did we install those early last year? Or, uh, last so we installed last those across the, you know, different places across the intersection. Um, we're going to install more uh, in May. Is May the time frame? May, June. Time frame, we're going to install more. Um, you know, those, we don't want everyone to know where they are, similar to like where the shot spotter sensors are, but uh, a major intersection like Mayflower and Western um, would very much make sense to be on the list. So I think you could. Probably safely say there there is a flock camera. I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, a wink, wink that the, the flock camera is there. Uh, and, and then we're we're also looking at, uh, and again this is in the the budget uh, for the use of this year, uh, setting up a real time crime center uh, that will take advantage of both the city owned uh, flock cameras as well as uh, businesses and residents who want to share. Um, their feet. That's a win-win for the whole area. Yeah. Thank you for that. And let me take this opportunity to thank you for the turning signal on sample. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, here's the next question. You mentioned um, um, 
We do. So we do hear, we, unfortunately, and as much as we don't like it, we like to move as quickly as possible, but sometimes it just, um, just the way things happen, it takes us longer than we like sometimes too. But we do hear, uh, we do hear uh, concerns being raised. And I remember, I mean, I don't know how many times you shared that with me personally over, over a few years. But, 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 yeah, cameras, cameras do work. I have to say my street alone, my little corner, it's a lot more peaceful since my great camera says you are being recorded. <laughs> like, it's less arguments with my neighbors now. Like, they all are scared of my, they don't, like, you should watch how they step on the sidewalk. It is beautiful, you know? Um, so I just encourage everyone to get great cameras and let them speak like you are being recorded. Like, it just, Everybody's quiet now, you know. So and is that an incentive from the city? Or no, that's just for me personally. Uh, is, would that be an incentive? We are working on the incentive program. So can you connect that with the um, with the um, 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 yard lighting? That program was in place last I year. Like and um, I even asked a question. There are six neighbors that would be interested. But then the first thing they say was, how much will it cost? And do we get an incentive? Yeah. Which I think would be a good way to to, um, to allow us to help in safety and, and health because um, property owners need an incentive. Um, their property is their business. I, I mean, they're, they're, we're trying very hard to do all the things that we need to do to keep the area safe. Right. And, we're in place. and when there's um, ideas and, and, and new developments and, and this sort of thing, I think a lot of the uh, attitude is, did nobody ask me, and those are my tax dollars, and how come they, da, 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 and it goes on and on. So I can't answer any of these questions. I can only go to my large people and then the representatives, and then when there's no response, and then you hear all of this negative, unfactual stuff, especially about the cameras, because everybody knows they're everywhere but out there. <laughs> so they don't, they not know where exactly, but why is that? So when you say, you know, budget problems, da, 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 that kind of, don't nobody want to hear that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, so, so the fact that, that it's that. in the plan, and when, I guess somebody will look up and say, I wonder if that's the camera, and it is, then that'll be the surprise for everybody. I am not going to say a word, but I'm glad to hear that it's legal and we can have one there. Yeah. yeah, so you know, the, the ones we won't talk about are those, the ones we do want to talk about are the businesses. We, a lot of us have gone up to Detroit and they have uh, something called Project Greenlight, mm -hmm. and they advertise businesses where businesses come with cameras, and they advertise that they have you know, they're a Project Greenlight site. And so that means they have the, you know, high definition video, they have the lighting they need, and they share that feed with the, the real-time center. Uh, so is that business, is that opportunity or capability uh, affordable in this area, or is that just, you went to Detroit to see it? Is, is it's affordable, yeah. So, I mean, to the business, it's about, uh, I think, $4,000. They, they think to get that up. Then they have to have internet and have the, the feed. Uh, but, uh, but most businesses have internet at this point in time. Uh, so the, the thought was, we haven't, these are still details to be working out, but the thought is there are some businesses that we know probably need it, uh, but may not want to do it. Uh, so there we might give a stronger incentive uh, and say, hey, we really need you to put this up because you are generating a lot of problems in your neighborhood. So there we'd have a strong incentive. On, on strategic corridors, you might have a, a match, like a 50-50 match kind of program. Um, and then, but in Detroit, it became so popular. They don't they don't subsidize it at all for the businesses, and they have a lot of once they once you prove that it's a value, then you know over time this can be something that uh, we, we don't have to subsidize at all. Well, that would be the, a, a good place to start because Western Avenue and and Olive would be another. Place and, and then um, Lincoln Way, you know, to the street. But I just thank you very much. I'm glad to Next thing I was going to ask. Yeah, we just can't issue take traffic tickets, basically.
pictures off the camera. Well, I didn't think, um, I, I wasn't looking at it to use for that. Because, you know, there was a, a, a horrible accident not long ago with the motorcycle. Had the camera been up there, you would have seen the boys going in and out of traffic. Some yeah. people saw it and didn't see it. So, but yeah. it would have been helpful. Um, on the um, electric bill thing, are you going through uh, real service through that energy? Uh, their program? Is it these two programs or is it separate? Uh, We're just uh, the utility and the That would be for the city water. Your water is on the basis. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, water, sewer, trash. Just water. The city oh. the city. Okay. okay. And then for, for electric, for electric, real service. Uh, uh, I think that's so you're, you're working in conjunction with them? Their program is separate. It's a separate program. Oh. So we, this program is for the city bill. Okay. Okay. We are setting up a website where we will have all the programs that the person is qualified for. Mm -hmm. Including those provided by other okay, parties, good. so that you can see who's eligible, when it's well, That seems to be a sticking point. If, if, if it's government money or something, you got to right. go by the guidelines. If yep. you're a dollar, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question. Yeah. 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 Just to make sure you know, so, so. Yeah. Is coordinating her team oh, is coordinating. coordinating a team that's also doing outreach going door to door in some areas. Oh. So but it's not just the website, there'd be people going as well. Because everybody doesn't have website capabilities. That's right. And we talked about that. Exactly. So will these programs be available to not only homeowners but renters? Because I sometimes as a renter, um Spring <laughs> Uh, I'm still going to advocate for them. Yeah. Um, we don't get respected, nor uh, the services are not open to us. The utility assistance program is for people who have utilities within their name. Okay. So it depends. We're, we're encouraging if you are a renter who has and the village and the landlord's name, and the, and the landlord basically has. Uh, uh, work into your rent, right. the Why utility you? cost. Mm -hmm. We think uh, it, it's up to the renter, but if the renter were, were to work with their landlord to put it into their name, then they would be able to, if they meet the qualified income qualifications, mm -hmm. take advantage of the program. Uh, the only reason that it's just difficult if, if it's in the landlord's name um, to basically make sure that Okay. Okay, last question about the LCG lighting. Um, you said it's going to be uh, citywide eventually, the conversion. Have yeah. you started it yet? It's, it's starting in uh, May, I think. When are you starting it at? I mean, is it, is it, are you, they were going to start. And then we can, and maybe, I think there's going to be a map when they, I mean, this is the power company that's doing it, the AP. But, okay. uh, when they get closer to starting, I think they'll have a map here in the time frame. But they're going to get the whole city in three or four months. Oh. So by early fall, the whole city will have that I talked to a rep because I, I had a, an issue with the inconsistent lighting on Western Island. It's horrible. And she kind of alluded to the fact that they could put a pole up anywhere and they know where they are and who's going to pay for it. And like I was supposed to know the answer to that. And I said, well, I don't know. Thank you for the information. So I'm just asking. Uh, I got her name at home. I just like, oh, like, oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. That was the representative of AEP, and she kind of raised my one here. <laughs> I didn't appreciate that answer because I was just trying to find out some information. But I'm glad to hear that. They're gonna light us up. And then, so once that, once they do that, then we're going to see what the gaps remain after that. All you gotta do is drive. I mean, <laughs> I told her that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Does anybody else have a question? Not, not question, but just three follow-up points. Uh, regarding the LED, we, there are some places they've been working on. Uh, I know because we actually put out a survey that um, Public Source had put out. We put it out to our officers. We actually got some really good feedback. Some cops were even taking pictures and sending us, say, hey, look at the difference. This is a before and after. This is a block ahead. Uh, it was actually quite remarkable, the difference that it made. Um, some of the stuff that they thought was going to change didn't, but many things did. So I can tell you from our perspective, you know, we are the 24-7, 365, especially at night. Um, but we're probably not going to get a true perspective until all the leads start to come back and yeah. things like that to, to really see. But I can tell you, notably, there's not as much hail leading through a windshield and things like that, at least from the cop's perspective. Um, then going backwards, uh, the mayor touched on the green light. I will tell you that the business people in Detroit have everyone that have these, these cameras that participate, they've seen either a 40, between a 40 and a 60% increase in revenue. People are more, they feel a lot safer going there now. So that's why they didn't have a problem paying. You know, we, we kind of ate, or they kind of ate the bill, kind of our, our thought processes at first, and then more people will join in. When you mention ring camera, absolutely, I have one too. I can literally pull anything from my ring camera and send it to somebody within 30 seconds. The problem that we've had, and I would challenge the neighborhood associations, everybody, please help us come up with something different. We've, we, we've always labeled it a camera registry. That just sounds so big brotherish, spiteful. Um, I'll tell you, we do have a lot of businesses, a lot of homeowners that have told us, you can access my camera anytime. No, 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 we don't want to do that. That is absolutely not what we want to do. But if something happens, we'd like to know, like if I can click on an Excel spreadsheet, I don't know if Santi started this years and years ago when we first came up with our transparency hub and all that stuff, to try to get people where I can look at, uh, we had an incident at 100 Elm Street. Oh, there's somebody has a ring or a Nest camera at 123 Elm. I can just look not go knock on your door, I can make a phone call and go, hey, we had the incident between 1 and 2 a.m., can you look at your camera, see if you have anything, and if you do, then just email it to us. Just that simple, then, but we're not, no, nobody seems to be buying into this, and, I, and it's just, it's baffling, not going to say nobody, because we do have some business, we've had people go, here's my IP address, you can look at it anytime. No, 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 we don't want to do that <laughs> at all, it's a lot of work, and then that requires search warrants and things like that. Yeah. If, if we call, you can willingly give up if in advance your 123 Elm is where I live. Here is my phone number. Anything ever happens, give me a call. You do have that, but not as many as we should have. The only thing I don't like is that I've had several police officers come to my door and ask me for them. And it's very uncomfortable, especially when you know your neighbor's got guns with lasers. Um, to, to interact like that. So a phone call would be way much better, in my opinion, or a text message, than a, a police officer in uniform on your front porch. Because then when you go take your trash out, hey, why was that cop put in front of your door? And I have to lie or come up with something clever, which I usually do, but it's uncomfortable because if they catch you, you don't know what's going to happen, you know? I'm, I'm like, serious, like, my neighbors will lift you up and put you in the dump, the trash can, and announce it to everybody. I've watched it several times. So, like, those are the fears that's in the community, like, mine, you know? But I do like the fact if we can have a link, like a, a number we can text it to, if we have concerns and footage, that would be great if the city could come up with a a phone number like, remember that song back in, when we were young? Why? Miss Sally? Mm-mm. That song? 1-800-4-7? Yeah, <laughs> like everybody remembered that song. The circuit song? Yeah. <laughs> like 588-2300 Empire? Like right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would be great if we had that and we could just text whatever we need communication-wise. Wouldn't that be cool? like we could do that, but I, I don't know what uh, the... CIO of Boston or uh, <laughs> of Boston, what do you, what do you think the technology there is? Uh, we're, we're trying to avoid, like literally trying to avoid, not because it's a work um, component, but it's called canvassing a neighborhood. And if people aren't willingly coming up and talking to us, we have no choice but to knock on doors 
However, if we had Tommy, if we see that camera, we know what the camera is, no doubt about it. We're going to knock on that door, no ifs, ands, or buts. However, if we had that in there, I can look on my little spreadsheet. I can just call it, doesn't matter where you are, and you can literally send it to any uh, officer on the police department through an email or a text message. Uh, we, yeah. all the time we can turn that in electronically. It's tagged as evidence, and it goes into our, into our system. Because the last the anonymous. Because the last shooting, they came knocking on my door. You know how uncomfortable that was? Yeah. Like, two people came up to me the next <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> it was like, why were they at your door? Did you just let them see it? <clears throat> I didn't see nothing, you know, which I didn't see anything. Um, but it was uncom it's uncomfortable. You're more afraid of the officers coming there or more afraid of the shooting that happened in front of your house? Um, both. Mm -hmm. Especially the so, officers and the shooting. What's going to no. happen after the problem is, the, problem is the shooting happened. Right. You're scared. Yep. Look, you know, you might pee on yourself. And then the police come. You feel a little bit safer. And then they leave. And then you're taking the trash down the driveway. And they're like, yeah, I saw a cop that come to your door. Did you show them your ring? Did you catch anything? And I'm like, no, I didn't catch anything, which I didn't. I did not. You know, but it was still, it's, I wish you would understand living in a neighborhood that doesn't respect life and that doesn't understand it's better to smack me than to shoot me, in my opinion. They don't understand that. I, like, easier to shoot. It's so easier for them to shoot. They have easy access to it. Like, when I go to bed, I pray that I wake up the next morning. Like, the, like it's it, it's a fear. It's, it's uh, Before I go home, I check my ring cameras before I go home. Like, I feel like I'm in prison. So, it seems easy to you guys to, oh, this give us the information or like to work with you. We want to work with you, but when we need help, you're not like Jesus, show up quick, you know? And you can't do that because there's not a lot of people that want to have your job. And we and we appreciate every officer that want to put that uniform on and go to work and put their lives in, in danger. Like for me, I appreciate every single one. But when you live in that neighborhood, like, I'm in fear every night I go home. And it's not something you can fix like that. I don't know how to fix it. I've tried to communicate with my neighbors, um, but it's still a fear. And we can't change them unless they're willing to change. And I don't know what to do to help them change. And I live there, like I'm friendly with them. They respect me sort of, you know? Sorry. Andrea Rogers put a comment up there related to police showing up gets us involved in a way that we work with them. Uh, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Andrea, but sort of touching on what Linda just said. No, not really. That's just essentially a summary of that. And it's what I hear from other people and what I've experienced. Um, but we know that it's like difficult for them to get any information without actually talking to people. So it's sort of like a double bind. Yeah. yeah. A big problem, honestly, is that everyone has a cell phone now. In the old days, we could open up a Haynes book and look up somebody's address. The officers could say, hey, look up a phone number for whatever your address is. And we'd open up your number. They could call but now there's no like central repository of everybody's cell phone numbers. So there's short of them going door to door, there's literally no way for them to preemptively reach out to people if they only have a cell phone, which more and more that's all that's all we have, cell phones. Yeah. And I understand the struggle. Please believe I do. I see it. Um, it's just hard to live in it, if that makes sense. So I think what we're gonna have to do is rely more on uh, the citizens given the cell phone number to a dispatch, giving it to us on our computer, we're contacting you two hours later. We don't have to show up. We're doing our report. We can call you on a cell phone and say, hey, anonymous, you know, you tell us what you've seen. If that's what it takes, we're more than willing to start. I think, that's, I think that should be the way we move forward right. um, with dispatch is encouraging that number and just really enforcing that. 
because I would be I'd be willing to give up my number over over you coming yeah. over to my yeah. front door yeah. anytime. Like call me, text me, DM me. One more question. Yes, because we you know, we would call it a camera registry. That registry, for whatever reason, does not. We found that it doesn't sit well with people. And quite frankly, trying to think of a different name. I mean, it is a registry, but it's not like a in a bad way. We have been literally racking our brains for years now. The best of the best. It's not just police. It's IT. It's mayor's office. It's city legal trying to come up with a different name. That's why my guess is probably why they went with the green light. It's legitimately a green light. Um, but I, I think I'm one of the things that, that um, Ms. Wilson was talking about on top of that, you have, I don't know if you're familiar with the First Amendment auditors. If you're not, I hope you never are. Um, but there are First Amendment people that go around with cameras and, and live shoot everything on YouTube. They also run the scanner traffic that at least is a 30 second delay. Um, I would like to have that totally encrypted so people couldn't hear that. It's not to be a sneaky thing, it's just to keep, protect people we're calling in so we don't have to listen to things like this and to live in fear from yet another perspective. Um, but with that being said, I would just tell you that they put that out publicly, real time, and then however much they get paid by their sponsors, more and more people get to view, get to hear your phone number, get to hear your address, get to hear your name. Um, and, and they do it, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. Caleb probably speak better than anyone on this when it comes to uh, APRO, which is public information. You know, quite frankly, there was a fatality car crash right here, in, right, and we witnessed it, and the media showed up. We, if I had knowledge of who the person that died in that car was, I would have to give them that. We just have a good understanding with our local media right now that until family members are notified of that, or a homicide, or a serious shooting, that we're not giving you that information. By law, we have to if they ask for it. So, that's another another thing that we're stuck with is you don't want to do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, but on the flip side, you don't want to curtail the law either because then it really isn't a predicament. And that's one thing that uh, just talking about public records and what is disclosable to the public. Um, one piece that's that's completely anonymous is, is if a crime were to occur, I'll let Chief speak to but there's also the Crime Stoppers tip line. Um, so that's not the police department. It's a, it's a separate phone number um, where people can provide tips and, and other information. Can they the send their rings on there? Uh, can you call there? Oh, um, can you text? They can. Here's the problem: they can't call you back when when a tip is submitted. Now you'd be assigned a code number, and you're supposed to. You're, they would give you a uh, like call us back on April 9th at 3 p.m. And our hope is that you call back. Then it could be facilitated where that video could be turned in. But um, if you guys have like a Facebook page yeah. that you only could click send message, so people don't post on there, you guys could post things on there. Right. But you would click message, and then I would send you my video, and then I could give you some information. Like I live in River Park. This is my address. This is what I caught on my camera. Just like somewhere where people can send it but then it's not blasted nobody knows i sent it only you guys would get it whoever is managing that messenger page i mean i just trying to like be creative with how do you make people feel comfortable yeah. putting it out there because once i send you my ring video that i captured it's going to have my face and my name above my message that i so you know who i am so there's not really an anonymous way to do that, but if you're the only one seeing it, I would feel a lot better. Like, then that communication right. is just between you and me. Right, but we, we don't have to, give, even if I knew your name, I don't have to give that up. Now, a judge can hopefully be contempt for refusing to, but it's you're going to be pretty hard pressed to get a judge to, to, for that extreme to put an officer in jail for contempt. It has happened uh, not to give up a confidential so there's many layers to this. Me, I would just tell you personally, I, with the whole new meta thing that's out, not even Facebook anymore, um, that's probably a beyond a gray area when it comes to public information versus private. Like literally there is no, no, I can tell you I had Facebook open up the other day and I told the mayor this, we, whoever I was talking to, we discussed, I hadn't seen Deborah Daniels, I can't tell you probably in 
six, five, five or six years. Facebook shut off. I went and pulled it back up, and two scrolls, and the first person on my thing was Deborah Daniels. <laughs> yeah. So what, that, that's kind of something that I understand on, on your all's behalf, too, because it's not just us. We're the least people you need to worry about. Right. Everybody else probably not from the United States has gotten more stuff from you than we ever could. My husband said, have you watched that Big Bang where they're in those fat suits? And I was oh. like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. So he sent me a picture. He went to Google, saved the picture. He texted to me. He opened up his Facebook and scrolled down and he's like, it's the, it was the same picture. I was like, <laughs> that was freaky. <laughs> well, um, did you have a question? I was just going to ask, um, uh, what's your sense Chief, about how the neighborhoods could work with the police department to address gun violence in South Bend. Just the, the situation that you're describing um, is terrifying. <laughs> That's open where you the live. Stay and have an open night Wednesday to beat up each other and then go home. Yeah. And <laughs> you referee that? Yeah, I'm gonna bring more referee. Yeah, I'll bring popcorn. <laughs> so I, I just I'm thinking I, we're, we've been talking at a very practical level, but I was just wondering if we it seems like a great opportunity since you're here um, and and we're here to think more creatively about what might be possible as as neighborhood associations can we work with you to try to reduce gun violence and change the culture in our city. Yeah, I mean, we just we just did the panel at the NNN was it two weeks ago? Yeah. Um, that's the second time we've had that there. We've had uh, with with SOAR. I know we've done them before, and our uh, RPN was an RPM W. Didn't we do one there for the park? Yep. RPN eight. Uh, we did, but those we we want to come to those. I know some of them are starting to get rebuilt again. I think Kennedy is starting to pick up uh, uh, in a, um, LaSalle Park. That used to be a huge one. Hopefully, we get that going. And, um, but those would be the best ones because, look, no matter what, we may have the greatest idea ever. It, coming from the police, it's not ever going to be good enough. I can assure you of that. Whether you like or dislike the police is irrelevant. It, it's just, it never sits well or very seldom where it catch on. If the idea comes from you, it will catch on. And that's only a benefit to us. We are nothing more than an extension of you all sitting here. And that, that's it. We just, you guys pay us to wear these uniforms with shiny stuff on them and expect us to do the job that either people won't or they can't. It, it's really that simple. What is not simple is the complexity that's involved in the, pa in the pandemic itself or epidemic of gun violence. This, this, is, this is mental, psychological, physical. It's a combination of everything that has gotten us to this point. And I tell you the biggest conundrum for the police, and there are many conundrums in policing, but one of the biggest ones is, you don't want police to be too hard on people, but then you want us to stop them from doing these bad things. So tell us which one it is, because there literally is no in-between. However, I think we have found an in-between. It's just a matter of more people doing a proverbial buy into this when it comes to group violence intervention, a different path than what somebody's on. It doesn't matter, I'm not saying it's a bad path and you should be like me. It's just a, whatever path you're on, you need to get off that one. I, like if I got up here and walked back and forth and pre pretending the grass was three feet high, walking back and forth would create, what, a path? And I'm not gonna walk in a different patch of grass because I already got this one down, so it's a heck of a lot easier. Something that we can do through GBI and the police department is, you know what, Let, let's step down some grass in a different direction. Let's let's change that path. And that's that's what our goal is is to do. When you're talking 217 cops and about 12 to 15 people from our Save Outreach, outreach uh, Goodwill through the city, we have 105,000 people in South Bend. Where are the other 104,000 plus people? That, that would be, that has been my, I know you said at the beginning, that is my frustration. 35 years, I and we have lived this begging. We're not the best, right? Again, we're only extension of our community. So I'm not pointing fingers, but if, if the community isn't the best, how are we expected to be? Together, we can be the best, though. Yeah. What's the status of the review? What's the what? Status of the review. I mean, as Ms. Hammond, she's right here. They're right. interviewing the directors as we speak. They had interviews. 
I, I kind of thought that that was going to be the connection that the we're working on it and, and everything got derailed, but we're working on it. Well, guys, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your time. If any of the neighborhoods would like to continue this conversation, please reach out to them. Maybe invite them to your meetings um, to learn more. I think they'll be more than happy to come to our neighborhood meetings and have smaller dis um, discussions, hopefully um, plans to better the neighborhood. Most importantly, working together. Let's work together. Um, let's see each other as friends. And um, just thank you so much for taking the time out tonight to um, have this meeting. Um, our next meeting will be the bus tour. Um, the bus tour will replace our July meeting. Um, again, the bus tour is July 23rd at 11 to 1. Please RSVP. We would love to see you on the bus. Um, the, following that, the next meeting is October 5th. Um, yeah, October 5th is after the bus meeting. Um, thank you so much for everyone's um, time. I keep saying that because time is really important and you chose it to um, hopefully make your community better by coming here. And that's all, that's our focus. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe the first maybe intended to be Yeah. Great. yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. Sorry for being over. <laughs> More on time than usual. <laughs> 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 everything's getting together again and, and COVID's gone and those meetings start coming back, we're going to see a lot more open communication. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Really, thank you for coming down. Hi, everybody. Good night. Thank you again, Nick. Please, Nick and Dallas.